from two notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I am a PhD candidate at the University of California, Riverside, and I will be your host for this web series. The purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, and we're using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize. Athletes get Olympic gold medals, and chefs get Michelin stars, actors get Oscars, musicians get Grammys, writers get Pulitzers, and scientists get Nobel Prizes. It's the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of human biology and ability to treat diseases. Today's episode is the first of a three-part series looking at Nobel Prizes awarded for the discovery of antibiotics, one of the most important discoveries in the history of medicine. We'll first be examining the 1939 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, which was awarded to Gerhard Domach. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Domach the award, quote, for the discovery of the antibacterial effects of Prontosil, unquote. We will be going over the process Domach used to discover the first commercially available antibiotic and end with a discussion about the interplay between science and politics, and we'll also talk about Nazis. But first, a little bit of background on Domach. Gerhard Domach was born in the Prussian province of Brandenburg in 1895. His father was assistant headmaster at a local school, which Domach attended, and after finishing high school, Domach enrolled in medical school at the University of Kiel. However, when World War I broke out in 1914, Domach signed up to join the German army after having completed only one semester of medical study. He was eager to do his part for Germany, but was wounded in 1914. He switched from being a soldier to a medical officer, helping in military hospitals on the German Eastern Front. While working in these hospitals, Domak saw firsthand the devastating effect of infectious diseases as he watched soldiers succumb to typhus, cholera, and other infectious diseases. He resumed his medical studies in 1918 and graduated in 1921. Rather than going into medical practice, he chose to go into laboratory research, focusing on bacterial infections. In 1925, he became Professor of Pathological Anatomy at the University of Münster. While working in this role, he also obtained a research position at the industrial giant IG Farben. In 1929, IG Farben opened the Bayer Institute of Pathology and Bacteriology, and Domach was appointed head of the institute. It was at this institute that Domach would make his Nobel Prize winning discovery. We'll come back to IG Farben in a bit, but for now you can think of them as the 1920s equivalent of Apple or Google. They were the largest company in Europe at the time, and certainly the world's largest chemical and pharmaceutical company. The company would employ a total of three Nobel Prize winning scientists, including Domach, and they were a major force behind Germany's economic prosperity. The company was a conglomeration of several companies, including the pharmaceutical giant Bayer, where Domach was working. Bayer had achieved enormous success with its marketing of a couple of drugs you've probably heard of before, aspirin and heroin. These pain relievers, because that's what heroin was originally developed for, had revolutionized medicine, especially surgery. But there were more medical discoveries to be made, and the company recognized that work still had to be done in the global fight against infectious diseases. So what was known about infectious diseases back in Domach's day? While scientists had made great strides in their understanding of the microbes that cause disease, numerous diseases like cholera, rickettsia, diphtheria, tuberculosis, malaria, and many, many more were shown to be caused by microorganisms. Scientists could use microscopes to detect these microscopic killers, and they began finding the microbes in sewage, in drinking water, and also on the ends of doctor's scalpels, which led them to greatly improve hygiene, sanitation, and water treatment practices at the end of the 19th century. 
scientists even found these microscopic killers in mosquitoes and lice. And they realized insect vectors could pass disease from one person to another. This led them to do things like drain stagnant water and spray people with insecticides. Additionally, scientists could isolate these disease-causing microorganisms and grow them up in labs. They found that weakening the microbe or killing it made it unable to cause disease. This allowed them to develop numerous vaccines made from these weakened pathogens. And you know what? These types of preventative measures worked. Many diseases that had been common became manageable with good public health practices and with vaccines. But while science had done much to help identify microbes and stop their spread, there was one area that had made little progress, and that was curing an already sick patient. The historian Thomas Hager puts it this way, quote, Once established in the body, once a disease gained entry into a patient, the best equipped and trained physician in the world in 1920 could do little more to affect the disease progress than a medicine man with a mask and bone rattle, or a medieval monk, unquote. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration. There were some things that doctors could do for patients to help them fight off infections, and we've talked about some of them on this podcast already. Neil Svinson had used phototherapy to cure certain skin infections, and Emil von Behring had great success using serum therapy to cure diseases, in some cases reducing deaths by 50%. But these treatments were not widely available and did not work against all pathogens. Serum therapy in particular took a long time to produce as it had to be collected from the blood of vaccinated farm animals. Serum therapy was also very targeted to work against only a single pathogen. World War I would show just how inadequate the treatments of the day were against infections. There was no way to produce enough serum therapy for the millions of wounded soldiers coming back from the front, and the standard practices of the day proved ineffective at preventing infections caused by Staphylococcus and Streptococcus bacteria. To top it off, World War I ended with a global influenza pandemic that would kill 50 million people, more than were killed by the bullets and bombs of the war. These events were enough to show just how weak medical science was against infectious diseases, but scientists hadn't given up hope. The fight against infectious diseases was about to get help from another scientific discipline. That discipline was chemistry. Paul Ehrlich stands out among scientists for his work bringing the chemical sciences into the medical sciences. He was an associate of Robert Koch and had already won a Nobel Prize before he turned his attention to infectious diseases. His specialty was with chemical dyes, and he sometimes is called the man with the blue fingers because he spent so much time working with these dyes. Ehrlich was using his dyes to stain cells. When you look at cells under the microscope, they usually appear clear, which makes them hard to see. But Ehrlich had used chemical dyes to stain cells different colors. This made the cells easier to see, and the dyes would also stain different parts of the cell, which allowed Ehrlich to see different cellular structures. Ehrlich's dye let him see differences between cells nobody had noticed before, and allowed him to classify different immune cells and blood cells and other cells of the body. The dyes could also be used to detect abnormalities in the cells to diagnose diseases. Ehrlich noticed something else about his dyes. The dyes were very specific at staining certain types of cells, but not others. Some of his dyes would bind really well to human cells, but not to bacterial cells, while other dyes bound the bacterial cells really well, but not the human cells. This led Ehrlich to hypothesize something he called the magic bullet. He reasoned there might be a chemical out there somewhere that would bind to bacteria cells and kill them while leaving the human cells alone. Such a drug would be toxic only to the bacteria, so it would be safe to inject into a person and wouldn't make the patient sick. Ehrlich's search for a magic bullet began with a dye called atoxyl. It had been discovered that atoxyl could kill the parasitic worms that caused African sleeping sickness. 
However, atoxyl was also toxic to humans. It would kill nerve cells, so it couldn't be used as a drug. Ehrlich wondered, however, if there might be a compound chemically similar to atoxyl that might still kill the worms without being toxic to the host. In 1909, Ehrlich and his associate Sahachiro Hata began testing over 900 different compounds to see if any might be effective. You'd think that out of 900 compounds, they would find one that worked, but unfortunately, they didn't. <laughs> However, they still got something out of the study. While they didn't find a drug for African sleeping sickness, they found one of their compounds, number 606, was very effective against the bacteria that causes syphilis. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted and sometimes fatal bacterial disease that was common back in Ehrlich's day. Ehrlich named his drug Salversin, and it was widely hailed for its effectiveness. However, it wasn't quite the magic bullet Ehrlich had hoped for. Its use was limited because the compound was very unstable when exposed to air, and there were also some serious side effects from the drug, which led some doctors to call for its removal. However, this introduction of what Ehrlich named chemotherapy, by which he meant using chemicals to treat disease, specifically infectious disease, this was an important step in the fight against infectious microbes. This brings us back to Damak. Damak was working at IG Farben, which was the world's largest producer of chemical dyes. These dyes were mostly used by the fashion industry to dye clothing. But Damak was aware of the method employed by Ehrlich to discover Salverson, and he had the world's largest inventory of dyes to choose from at IG Farben. Damak began screening the dyes, both old and new, to see if any might be able to selectively kill bacteria. He was particularly interested in drugs effective against the Streptococcus and the Staphylococcus bacteria. Today, we think nothing about a strep throat infection, but back in those days, strep could and often did become life-threatening, especially if the infection spread to the blood or spinal fluid. Over one million people in Europe were dying every year from strep infections. And unfortunately, serum therapy, the top technique of the day for treating bacterial infections, didn't work against strep and staph. That's because serum therapy targets very specific pathogens. This means that it works very well for things like diphtheria, where all cases of the disease were caused by the same toxic bacterial protein, and it even works for something like SARS-CoV-2. But there are over a dozen different species and hundreds of strains of streptococcus that cause disease in humans. Making serum therapies or vaccines for each individual strain of strep was logistically impossible. So a drug that could target all of these various types of bacteria would be a miracle. And Damak would find that miracle drug. Damak began his search for an effective chemotherapy against bacteria by combing through the dyes made at IG Farben. The chemists from Damak's lab would then take the more promising dyes and chemically modify them to generate hundreds of potential drug compounds for testing. After four years of work at the company, Domak's lab had tested over 3,000 chemicals, looking for something that could safely and effectively kill bacteria. Unfortunately, the search had come up blank. Then, in their fifth year of searching, they found one. The drug was based on one of the company's red dyes that had been chemically linked to a compound called sulfanilamide. Domak's lab tested the drug in mice. 26 mice were given a lethal dose of streptococcus bacteria, then 24 hours later, 12 of the mice were given the drug. All the mice given the drug survived, while all the mice not given the drug died within 48 hours. And best of all, all the mice showed no side effects from the drug. This was exactly what Damak had been searching for. Oddly though, the drug had no effect on bacteria outside of the mouse. When Damak's group added the drug to Streptococcus in a test tube, the bacteria grew like normal. However, there was no doubt that the drug was curing the mice, so the company was ready to move on to the next stage of testing the drug, which was in humans. Nowadays, if a drug company gets good results in a mouse model of disease, 
They then enter the highly regulated world of clinical trials before they are allowed to market the drug. However, back in 1935, there was no such standards and human trials were not closely monitored or held to the same scientific standard that they are today. So instead of performing a randomized, controlled clinical trial in patients, the company gave the new drug to local doctors on a case-by-case -case basis. This meant that all the evidence for the drug's effectiveness in people was anecdotal, which is the weakest kind of evidence. However, the anecdotal evidence was very promising. Doctors were seeing patients they had considered beyond hope of saving make full recoveries after taking the drug. Damak himself used the drug on his daughter when a puncture wound on her hand got infected with strep. The infection was so bad the doctors were considering amputating her hand, but after she began taking the drug, her infection cleared. The company filed a patent for the drug under the brand name Prontosil, and Damak published his lab results in 1935. The next year, the largest human trial of the drug finally took place in England with a group of 64 patients. It was not a controlled trial. All of the patients were given the drug, so again, not really up to modern standards. But the results were still better than anything anyone had seen before. 61 out of the 64 patients survived, a less than 5% mortality rate. This was a drastic decrease from the historical mortality rate of 25%. News of the drug began to spread, and then something unexpected happened. In 1936, a group of French scientists working at the Pasteur Institute wanted to run their own animal tests with Prontosil before approving the drug for distribution in France. They gave Prontosil to infected mice, but they also gave the mice sulfonilamide, chemical group attached to the dye that formed the backbone of the Prontosil drug. Amazingly and unexpectedly, the sulfonilamide completely protected the mice from Streptococcus. This was surprising to everyone and had two important consequences. First, it explained why Prontosil hadn't killed bacteria in the test tube. Prontosil is what's called a prodrug. Prodrugs are converted to their active form inside the body. In the case of Prontosil, enzymes in the gut of the mouse or person digest the drug, which releases the sulfonilamide from the dye, after which the sulfonilamide can then go off to kill the bacteria. The French scientists realized it was the sulfonilamide, not the dye, that was the real antibiotic. This was completely counterintuitive to everything the scientists in Damak's lab had been going on. How could it be that the dye was useless and the sulfa was the drug? It made no sense to them. But the data was solid. Sulfonilamide was the antibiotic, not the dye. Which meant Damak's discovery of the first class of antibiotics was entirely serendipitous. Now, the second consequence of the French group's finding was really bad news for IG Farben, but amazing news for every other drug maker in the world. The bad news was that IG Farben had patented sulfonilamide for dye making back in 1990, not as a dye itself, but as a chemical intermediate for dye making. However, that patent that they had filed had expired. This meant Every drug company in the world could use sulfonilamide, and use it they did. Derivatives of sulfonilamide popped up in every country with an organic chemist to their name. The drug spread around the world like lightning and started saving millions and millions of lives. In 1939, just four years after his publication of Prontosil, Damak was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. However, his acceptance of the Nobel Prize would land him in jail. It's at this point in the story we turn from science to politics, which in Damak's case means we get to talk about the Nazis. Damak was arrested soon after his winning of the Nobel Prize because Hitler had banned any German national from accepting any Nobel Prize. Why would Hitler care about the Nobel Prize? Well, excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. 
To answer that question, we have to go back to the 1935 Nobel Peace Prize. For background, the will of Alfred Nobel established five Nobel Prizes in different fields, three in the sciences and two in the humanities. The three science prizes are physics, chemistry, and physiology or medicine, and the two humanities prizes are peace and literature. Though there's drama to be found in all the Nobel Prize categories, the Peace Prize tends to be the most controversial. The controversy of 1935 was the awarding of the Peace Prize to Karl von Ozietzky. Ozietzky was a talented journalist and outspoken Nazi critic. He was the one who exposed to the rest of the world that Hitler was remilitarizing Germany, a direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. Ozietzky's criticism of the Nazis landed him in a concentration camp, and it was from that concentration camp where he was told about his winning of the Nobel Peace Prize. However, when Hitler learned the award went to Ozietzky, he forbade mention of the prize in the newspapers, forbade Ozietzky from accepting the prize, and banned any German national from accepting any of the Nobel Prizes. So, in 1939, when Damak wrote to Sweden, thanking them for recognizing him with the award, Damak was arrested. Damak had not actually stated in his letter to Sweden that he accepted the prize, but he had sent his letter without first notifying the Nazi Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so they felt the need to bring him in to, quote, verify his personal trustworthiness, unquote. The Nazis spent a week questioning him, and then let him go on condition that he decline accepting the prize, which Damak did. He was allowed to return to his job at IG Farben, where he would stay for the rest of World War II, keeping his head down and his nose in his lab notebook, as it were. He never did join the Nazi party. After the war, in 1947, he was eventually allowed to go to Sweden to receive his Nobel Prize. So where are we at with the sulfa drugs nowadays? Well, they are still around, but not widely used. The sulfa boom lasted about a decade, then was replaced by the next generation antibiotics penicillin and streptomycin, which will be the topics of the next two episodes on this podcast. But sulfa was a miracle of its time, and it's still talked about as a wonder drug. I was delighted to hear Sulfa mentioned on the anime Dr. Stone last year, and I'm amazed the drug has reached as far as fictitious anime realms. <laughs> but aside from the story of Sulfa's amazing power to cure disease, Sulfa's story is also a lesson about the relationship between science and politics. IG Farben, the mega company where Damak worked and where Sulfa was marketed, was a scientific powerhouse in more ways than just antibiotics. IG Farben ended up becoming an important ally of the Nazis, and their factories would help supply oil and synthetic rubber to the German military. But most significantly, IG Farben was the company that produced the poison gas that was used at German concentration camps to kill millions of Jews as part of the Holocaust. The company would also build a factory next to Auschwitz, where some 30,000 prisoners were used as slave labor. These were horrendous acts, and at the infamous Nuremberg trials, 13 of IG Farben's directors were found guilty of crimes against humanity. It is a bitter irony that the company that would save millions of lives with the first class of antibiotics would also be responsible for the deaths of millions of Jews in the Holocaust. So, how are we to process that? Is IG Farben proof that science itself is a horrible evil that should be stopped? Or should we say something like, it's governments like the Nazis that bring out the evils of science, so we need to keep politics out of science? Well, I think it's good to remember that science is a morally neutral discipline. However, science is performed by scientists who are not morally neutral. The same is true of governments. Now, since science can be used for either good or evil, the relationship between science and politics works best when governments rein in the evil and promote the good. For my part, despite the evils that have come from scientific advancement, 
I am very thankful for the incalculable good that science has brought about. I am also very thankful there is government oversight of science. I'm glad the United States has an FDA that ensures drugs are properly tested for safety and effectiveness. As much as I know people want to keep the politics out of science, science is necessarily political. In light of that fact, I believe the best course of action is to make sure our elected leaders have both good moral character and a good understanding of what science is and how it works. I think that would put us in the best place as a country to see the best that science has to offer. Okay, so that concludes this episode of Notable Nobels, and I promise I won't make a habit of talking too much about politics. <laughs> Next time, we'll continue looking at Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine related to antibiotics. We'll be talking about the completely unexpected discovery of a drug so effective and safe it quickly surpassed sulfa drugs as the top antibiotic in the world, and it is still in use today. What was that drug, and what made its discovery so remarkable? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.